Last July, Terry Holliday was named Commissioner of Education in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. But prior to that appointment, Terry served for seven years as the superintendent of the Iredell Statesville School District. And I have to have him tell me if I pronounced that right. So I'm doing OK. Um, this is a K through 12 public school system that serves a diverse community of more than 20,000 students in southwestern North Carolina. Over his very impressive career, Terry has received many awards and honors, but there are two that really resonated with me. In 2009, he was named North Carolina Superintendent of the Year. And in 2008, under Terry's leadership, Iredell Statesville Schools received the Malcolm Baldridge Quality Award. This is a tremendous accomplishment. Iredell, I think, is just the fifth K through 12 school system to be recognized with this national honor. And it's the first and the only one in the southeastern United States. Please join me in welcoming Terry Holliday, who will tell us how to ignite a passion for learning. Thank you, Katie. It's been a wonderful year. Um, my wife and I were at the Florida Sterling. That's a very nice conference, uh, kind of like this one. You guys have one of the top in the nation, too. But we were down there. They hold it at the JW Marriott, right beside the Ritz-Carlton. So little boy from uh, Belton, South Carolina, and a little girl from Iowa, South Carolina. I looked at her and I said, in your wildest dreams, would you ever believe we've been here? I've been to Sweden to talk, you know, we've won the Baldridge Award, we're fixing to go in and uh, be uh, Commissioner of Education in Kentucky. In your wildest dreams, would, would you ever think that we could make it this far? And she said, honey, uh, you're not in my wildest dreams. <laughs> Guys, just, just what you're about is you're about change, and you're about change for the better, and it's not an easy journey. So we're here today to kind of pat each other on the back. So I want you to look at the person to your left and right and pat them on the back and say, you're looking good today. Let's look at this. Whoa, that's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello! There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Help! 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 <laughs> I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. Okay, raise your hand. How many of you have ridden an escalator? Well, there's not enough left to do. All right, turn to your neighbor and tell them what that they should do to solve their problem. <laughs> now, raise your hand if you had some type of private or public schooling, K-12. Raise your hand. Now, turn to your neighbor and tell them you know how to fix public education. <laughs> the point is, everybody is an expert in public education. And they tell us every day how to fix public education. Now, my dad had open heart surgery, but I sure as heck don't hear him telling the doctors how to perform open heart surgery. That's the difference between public education, health care, business, and, and everything else, is everybody's an expert about public education. I didn't know how many experts there were until I met 138 uh, senators in the House of Representatives in Kentucky. Y'all don't have anything like that in Tennessee, do you? Okay. It, it is an interesting industry, education. But let me tell you what makes the difference. There's a guy there, uh, the, the only adult there at the bottom of the screenshots there. That young man was principal of our alternative school. 
that young man had a passion for learning. He wanted to learn all about alternative schools. That young lady beside him dropped out of school as a teenage mother. That young man got her back in school and made sure she graduated. That's the way you solve our public education issue is through relationships and keeping the passion for learning in your organizations. Now, your health care, your business, you've got something like this. You either fired the CEO because of mismanagement. Anybody here not have budget problems? If, if you've got budget uh, surplus and everything's running great, I'd love to know about it because I don't know of any state government, federal government agency that doesn't have budget problems. You got non-performance on one of your uh, profit lines. We had major non-performance on student achievement, our major bottom line in education. But what was even worse, we had a community that didn't expect it to be much better. There'd been a long history of the county school system just not having high expectations for kids, and the city system had gotten in trouble. Jesse Register, who's now superintendent here in the Nashville area, had done a great job in merging the two districts in the early 90s, got it set up, ready to go, and then we had a couple of uh, leaders in between Jesse and myself that led to these problems. There was low trust because the superintendent had been fired. Back then, in the early 2000s, they just started putting a lot of stuff on the web, communicating through the internet, and they had a trial uh, for the superintendent, and all 80 findings were on the web page. So everybody in the community knew everything. And so anytime you try to do anything, everybody look at you and they didn't trust you. There was very low trust, low morale. But you know, there are great people everywhere. The great thing about Baldridge is it's not the people that are the problem, it's the system that's the problem. So you're always working to improve the system. Now, let's talk about the escalator again. Those two people, the point of that story a little bit is that those two people were confronted with a situation that they had never encountered before. We are in a time that we are facing problems that we've never quite faced before. And our problems are getting huge whether it's the federal debt, whether it's health care, whether it is figuring out how to help every child be college ready and graduate from high school. We as leaders are facing huge challenges we've never faced before. And that's what I was facing when I took this system. But I had a great board. Guess what, I had a, a physician, I had a general practice he knew what PDSA was, and he knew that we needed to commit to continuous improvement and a systems approach to improving that school system. So what you had to have is you had to have a governance structure and a board support to make the changes that were going to be necessary. Learning centered focus. You got a lot of teachers that will say, I taught it, they just didn't learn it. What we have new in education now is you hadn't taught it until you show that they've learned it. John Wooten, great basketball coach, UCLA, that's one of his favorite things. I didn't teach it until they demonstrated that they had learned it. So that's the new approach in education. It's not just enough to cover the material. You've got to figure out how the kids demonstrate their learning. So the board uh, backed us on this, but the big thing, you've got to have a driver we said we're kind of like bottom third in North Carolina in most measures. Some measures we were like last. What we want is we want to create a vision that we will become a top 10 performer in North Carolina. That was our vision. That's where we wanted to be. We set benchmark years. We said in three years, we'll be at state average. In five years, we'll be the best in our comparative group. And in seven years, we'll reach top 10 status in North Carolina. So let's kind of go through the journey and see how we did. I can't emphasize this enough. Ed Deming is you know, certainly all of our uh, 
favorite in this work, and many of us have roots that go all the way back to Deming. But that was it. Problems are system-based, not people-based. But the clash I had when I went in is the teacher said, well, it's always somebody else. They always blame someone else. So I had a clash between saying we need to improve the system versus people saying, well, you know, I'm fine. It's those other people that aren't doing their job. The teaching system versus the learning system. Decisions made with regard to tradition. We've always done it this way before versus let's look at the data, analyze it, and come up with a new solution to this problem. Innovation versus status quo. That is the foundation of my philosophy right there. And if you want to test that hypothesis or philosophy, here's what I challenge you to do. I want you to go visit kindergarten classrooms. And I want you to notice how many children in a kindergarten classroom have a passion for learning. If you go in and read, and you're reading it, and you ask them, how many of y'all have a dog? Every one of them raises their hand. Every single one. Whether they got a dog or not. They got a story about a dog. <laughs> and if they don't have a story about a dog, they'll make up a story about a dog. They are so excited about learning and sharing what they know, and just the excitement is there. And then I challenge you to go visit high school classrooms where the notes of the lecturer go through the ears of the listening student without anybody retaining the knowledge. I call it cemetery teaching. All the kids are in nice rows and they know to be quiet. <laughs> now, you're going to find different methods out there. You're going to find great high school teachers, but I I just dare you to take any measure, take any measure. We were looking yesterday in Kentucky at our eighth grade uh, Explore, which is part of the uh, ACT program, you know, the college readiness uh, measure that's kind of akin to SAT. And I think in, in Tennessee, you guys do this too. Tenth grade was planned, and then the eleventh grade is ACT. What I know is this. The longer we keep them in school, the worse they do. So I've got a solution for school reform. Let's let them go at the end of eighth grade. We'd do a lot better. Now, you take any satisfaction measure, any climate measure, you take any measure, parent confidence in school performance, the longer we keep them in school, the worse the performance becomes. Now, why is that? Ed Deming had it right. Our job is to increase the successes that kids have, not increase the failures that they have. So our system was set up to fail children, to sort them out and get them out into the workforce. It's the same in North Carolina. It was the same in South Carolina. It's the same in Tennessee. It's the same in Kentucky. What North Carolina was doing is we had to sort the kids because only about 25% of them needed to go to college and the rest of them just needed, you know, basic skills so they could work in the furniture industry, the textile industry, and other odd jobs. In Detroit, Michigan, Flint, Michigan, the same thing. We sorted the kids because only 25% needed to go to college the rest of them had a very comfortable job waiting for them at General Motors, Ford, or other major automakers or suppliers to automakers. Now, are those jobs still there? No. Where are the jobs now? Well, healthcare, you're growing, government growing, but that's probably the wrong growth for our economy. Where are the jobs today, and what are the skill requirements for the jobs today? 54 to 64-year-olds, America still leads the world in the percentage of uh, 54 to 64-year-olds with high school degrees. We lead the world. We had figured that out. 
We had figured that 70 to 75 percent high school graduates was just fine. That's why our economic 50s and 60s and 70s were pretty strong. Today, by some measures, we're 18th or 19th in the industrialized world. But we hadn't changed. What's happened? Everybody else has changed. 54 to 64-year-olds, we still lead the world in the percentage of uh, folks with four-year degrees. Still lead the world. 24 to 34-year-olds, guess what? We're 14th. All you need to do is travel, and many of you in this room have been to India, you've been to China. There was an entrepreneur the other night, I was sitting at a round table, and he looked and he said, we invest huge amounts of money in startup businesses. He said, I've got a team that that's all they do is they search for startup businesses to invest money. I gave them a challenge a couple of months ago. I said, find me the best startup. I'd like for it to be in the U.S., nonprofit, or I mean a profit uh, type thing. Show me the best in the U.S. we can invest in to make the best money. Three months later, the team comes back and, they, and uh, he says, well, what'd you find out? And they said, well, We've got good news and got bad news. Good news is we found a, uh, a business that if we had invested three years ago, we had gotten a 100% return on, and it's projected to do even better over the next three years. Problem is, it's not in the U.S. It was in educational services in China. Ladies and gentlemen, public education is the foundation for your economic future. And if we don't fix this system, our economic future in all of your industries is in trouble. And to fix the system will take not a few tweaks, not reform. It's going to take disruptive innovation. So what I believe is most people show up to work every day wanting to do a great job. Now I want you to think and envision in your mind do you know anybody that shows up every day and wants to do a half-assed job? <laughs> oh, yeah, I know one, okay? Yeah, uh, I know that one, okay? But think the vast majority of people show up and want to do a good job every day. Now, what the problem has been, are you igniting a passion for learning in all of your employees? That's my job as Commissioner of Education in Kentucky, to ignite a passion for learning in all the superintendents and school boards in Kentucky. Then it is the job of the superintendents in Kentucky to ignite a passion for learning with their school leadership teams. Then the school principal's job is to ignite a passion for learning with all the faculty and staff. And then it is ultimately the teacher's responsibility to keep that passion for learning as a flame in every child. That way, you're focusing on the system and focusing on what will help make it work. And this will work in healthcare, it'll work in uh, nonprofits, it'll work in government, it'll work everywhere. How do you get it working? Well, as a superintendent, in a new situation that I had never encountered before because I'd always worked in pretty high achieving school districts. I'd never worked in a low achieving school district. I'd never worked with one that had major budget problems. I was faced with the escalator. It stopped and I didn't know what to do because I had something brand new facing me. So what did we do? Thank goodness we used the Baldrige framework. Why did I use it? Great framework, great blueprint, gives you the right questions to ask, doesn't give you the answers, but it gives you the right questions to ask, and it gives you a tremendous measure to compare yourself not only with other education organizations, but uh, you know, when people say we want world-class schools, nobody's got a measure except this one right there. That's a measure. That could tell you whether or not you have a world-class school. And I was lucky that those seven components made sense to me because I had been a high school band director, and uh, if any of you guys that know about that kind of thing, it's kind of like uh, football coaching. You've got to have a great system if you're going to have a great program. You've got to have everybody knowing the processes, everybody knowing the results, everybody knowing where you're heading. 
So those components made a lot of sense to me and still do. Now, the key for me, I think, was uh, state level examiner training. But the real key, the breakthrough for me, came when I went to national level training and was sitting beside you know, great folks in this room. And they introduced me to ADLI. And to this day, this is what's wrong with my bureaucracy. I don't know if it's what's wrong with your bureaucracy or your business, but we are great at getting new approaches. We do a terrific job with getting new grants. We're always chasing grants. We're always chasing new money. And for every new grant, new program, we hire new people. And then when the grant runs out, everybody says, how are you going to keep these people? What we don't ever really do is strong deployment with great measures to let us know whether or not that program works. What education is terrific at, and maybe your industry is terrific at too, is not getting rid of stuff. Do you have processes in place to get rid of stuff that's not working? Well, if you don't have ADLI, if you don't have the L, for the learning cycle to determine if this process is working or not, then you're never going to know what to get rid of. Okay, so now we've got a process check. All right, we've been going a little bit while. I want you on a piece of paper or on your, uh, a lot of you do PDA things, your Blackberries there. Uh, write big numbers. One, two, three. One, two, three. Put it somewhere for you to use it. What I want you to do is one, two, three, I want you to take about 15 seconds and reflect. Have you heard one thing, two things, or three things, but at least one thing? Have you heard one thing yet that might be interesting and you might want to follow up on? Okay, think for about 15 seconds. Have I heard one thing that I might want to follow up on with my leadership team or relate to my local superintendent or tell the local school board member that I go to play golf with on Saturday? One, two, three. Now, throughout the rest of this uh, talk, try to fill in two and three. Then, write down right below the one, two, three, write one, two. You're going to write two things out of those three that you're going to direct somebody to do a little bit more research on. And then right below the one, two, write a big one. That's where you're going to write at the end of this conversation this morning, that's where you're going to write one thing I'm going to do. It might be that you get pumped up and you want to help public education in some way. It might be that it's one thing that you want to do with your business or industry. Okay, so this will help us all out because this will be my evaluation at the end whether or not you guys all have one thing that you're going to do because a speech isn't worth anything unless you find something out of it that you can take and actually use. Um, any business, this will work. Uh, I'm doing this in Kentucky. It's just taking longer. Uh, in my district, I went, there were 35 schools. I went to every school and asked three questions. I said, what's getting in the way of kids learning and reaching high levels of learning? What do you need to help all children learn? And what do you expect from me as superintendent since the last superintendent didn't do too well uh, with your trust? Now, what you find out is you find out the same thing. You will find out the same thing if you ask these questions. What's getting in the way of us helping more patients? You know, what's getting in the way of us not uh, making our profit plan this time? Same questions, just substitute your business. <clears throat> what you're going to find is you're going to find people who say, it's not me. What our teachers told me is they said, uh, we got a problem with the apathy of our students. Our high school students lack motivation. Our middle school students don't care. Our parents don't care. We don't have enough computers. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough resources. You don't pay me enough. Our class size is too big. Everything was external. Nothing was related to, well, I could do a better job in delivering instruction. Or we may not have the right curricula standards. Or we may not be assessing our kids and learning from the assessments. None of that. It's always external. What do you need? Well, you know what the answer was. We need more 
teachers, we need fewer kids, we need more money, we need more, everything was external. Now, the one thing they did say about superintendent is we wanted the superintendent visible. What that gave me was my 360 uh, leadership expectations and the way the school board eventually evaluated me. Also, you find out this. You find out that we're okay with the way it is. There are, about, there are four different groups of people out there, and they're all in your organizations too. You've got believers. You could go out and tell them the sun is uh, brown, and they'd believe you. And you could go out and say, we need to try this new program, and they'd be like those kindergarten kids. They'd be raising their hand, eager to get going right away. The believers. In school systems, you've got believers. They believe that all kids can learn. The next group you got is those tweeners, those folks that are fairly new to your organization and they hadn't figured out where the power structure is yet. They don't know who's really in charge. Then you got those people who are survivors. We got survivors in school systems. These are teachers that every day bargain with the kids, if you'll behave today, I'll give you 30 minutes to watch a video. If you'll behave today, I won't give you any homework. If you'll behave today, I'll give you the test answers before the test on Friday. They're just trying to survive mentally and physically every single day. But the group that you got out there is called fundamentalists. They wouldn't change a thing because they control everything right now. They are very comfortable in the zone. This is your English teacher who's been doing it for 30 years. She only has AP English, and if anybody ever tried to take it away from her, she'd, she'd make sure they didn't keep a job. These are the people that anytime you come in and say, hmm, maybe we need to reform a little bit in education here, maybe we need to think about the kids a little bit more rather than the adults, that's the one that always says, I was here before you came, and I'll be here after you're gone. All of y'all have people like that. All of you have those people. So what you've got to do is you've got to get a hold of those people and you've got to figure out how to deal with those people. So in my breakout, I'll be talking even more about change leadership because that is the key. So in Kentucky, I'm visiting 174 school districts and I have to visit schools and I'm listening and I'm kind of asking the same three questions. Now, what I know is this. And all of you Baldridge experts, you know this. You've got to have the right process, but it's got to be focused on the right target. Let me show you and demonstrate what I'm talking about here. That's worked real well uh, here lately. Uh, I did it at Florida Sterling, and they said, hmm, you know, don't quite get it. Well, you know what it is? Uh, he had the wrong target, and his process wasn't very good either. You know, he didn't have the right tools. He didn't, I, you know, he was just kind of random. Hopefully, y'all don't have to do that this afternoon, but I hear a little bit more is coming. Those were the key processes we had to fix in Iredell Stasis. The first one and the most important one was making sure that our strategic plan was, was right and was focused on the right stuff. The biggest mistake I made, we started out, we had 35 goals. It, we finally got it down to about 10, 10 strategic goals. Now in Kentucky, I'm working on one, one strategic goal. Every child graduates college or career ready. And i got to have a measure for the college and the career ready. I'm excited that uh, No Child Left Behind and Secretary Duncan, President Obama, are going in this direction because they know that while the test scores are important and they give us some measures along the way, they are not the goal. The goal is making sure the kids are ready for the future that they're going to encounter. 
And every business person in here, every healthcare person in here that hires kids who graduate from our high schools or our two-year universities or our four-year colleges, that's what you want. You want those kids to go college ready. You a parent in here? Half the kids in the nation that graduate from high school have to take remediation courses at community colleges or four-year colleges. Some states it's 60%. You have to pay for those courses and the kids don't get credit for them. That's a costly rework. Those of you in business, you're having to rework. There's an error been made. You're having to rework. We need to eliminate that waste in our education system. It will save us, save the school systems, the colleges, and parents millions of dollars. We had a board that uh, was outstanding the leader of the board, the, the, a physician. He understood continuous improvement. His hospital system that he worked with was going through a lot of the Baldrige's effort at the time, so he was right on top of it. And those were some key components. The board understood what they did. They didn't spend two hours talking about band uniforms. They spent their time talking strategic. They didn't meddle in who we hired or who we fired unless there was something they needed to know for uh, legal purposes. They had a survey and they did a self-assessment twice a year using the Baldrige criteria, self-assessment. They had a survey of their customers to let them know how they were doing. They had an improvement plan. Just one quick example. They did a survey one year and uh, we had always asked the same question, how do you think the relationship of the Board of Education is with the governing bodies uh, that impact schools. In North Carolina, commissioners in the county control the budgets. They control the school district budgets, how much money the school district would get. So the board survey came back and said, oh, you're not doing too well. So they put in place some improvement strategies like a uh, capital outlay committee that had two board members, two commissioners, and citizens group to develop a long-range facilities plan. We put it in place and we passed the first bond referendum you know, that required a tax increase since 1947. This stuff works. Until that time, they kept pointing fingers and blaming people. The board said the commissioners. The commissioners said the board. Everybody outside said, none of y'all working well together. Sound like Congress and the president, doesn't it? Okay. Maybe we should, uh, Jeff, send, uh, send them over a little thing, maybe how we could improve two-way communication, okay? All right, here was the model. Here was the process Focus on the right target. I'm, I think you all have handouts, but you won't be able to read the questions, but the right target is to raise achievement and close gaps. Our correct target in Kentucky will be we're going to raise the percentage of kids that are going, that are prepared for college, and we're going to make sure that African-American children, Hispanic children, children with special needs, any child with English second language, that there's not a huge gap between their percentage of college ready and white children. Where we need to really make it in Kentucky is percentage of children that are in poverty, how they're doing compared to children that are not in poverty. That's probably a lot of your issue in Tennessee also. The way to do that is make sure you've got the right process focused on the right target is what questions are you asking and our questions were pretty simple. They're the same questions for any school district, any classroom, any national organization. What do we expect kids to know and be able to do? 48 states are coming together to really define that as a nation. How many billions of dollars have we wasted over the last 30 years in every state coming up with their own standards, every school district then coming up with their own standards, and then every classroom coming up with their own standards, and everybody looking at each other when the tests don't do very well and say, it's the kids. We've got to have real agreement on what we expect kids to know and be able to do to be college ready. And I think that's where this uh, collaborative effort uh, is coming. Then we've got to know how are we going to measure it? And just one day, one shot tests are not the be all of measurement. Teachers need to be measuring every day. 
teachers need to be looking at the next question, which is, what's the best instructional strategy? What's my approach here, and did I deploy it well? And then looking at learning. Did my kids meet mastery? And then looking at intervention. What am I going to do if these children didn't learn it? And then looking at the gifted kids, what am I going to do with kids who already know this stuff? The three legs of this are the same. They are now becoming a national recognition of this is the new system of education for the future. Strong focus on outcomes, not just test scores, but raising achievement. I think the college readiness is certainly where we're headed. Having strong essential curriculum that everybody agrees this is what every child to be competitive with those kids in India and China that are wanting to take our jobs, here's what our kids need. And we don't need to be competitive just with them. We need to teach them innovative, creative skills because they've got to create the jobs of tomorrow because the jobs of yesterday are not going to be here. Formative assessments, not just one day, one time tests. You all know the difference between formative and summative. Formative is like a physical. You go to the doctor, the doctor says to me, he says your blood pressure is too high, you eat, need to eat better, you need to exercise a little more. A summative is an autopsy. It's when you're dead, but cut you open and say, hmm, that's why he died. Our summative test, third grade, end of grade test, is, a, is an autopsy test. It basically says, poor kid, didn't make it. It's too late to do anything. The formative assessments are much more important. And you in business, you know that. You need to be looking monthly statements. You need to be looking at process measures to keep the process improved to get the big, big achievement. The other thing is teachers can no longer go in and shut their door and say, leave me alone, let me teach. They must be in collaborative teams working together. Well, did we make it? Here's what happened. We were on many measures in 1999 toward the bottom of the state. Uh, a couple of things had happened pretty good, but we were still well below state average. We met state average in two years. We were better than our benchmark districts in four years, and we became a top 10 district in six years. We beat our timeline by one year. Now, the people working a system did that. Without a system, the people would have just kept doing what they were doing. The system achieved those results. No one person achieved those results. Other things that happened, um, academic composite uh, was uh, 55th to 9th graduation rate. We had one of the worst uh, dropout rates in North Carolina, but our graduation rate wasn't too good either. We went from uh, 53rd to 11th. Now that's a cohort graduation rate. That means every child was tracked. There are a lot of confusing graduation rates in the nation, but that one right there would uh, put us certainly in the top 10% in the nation of graduation rates. SAT scores below state average went to one of the top 10 in the, in the state. Reading was improving, math was improving, but here's what I was most proud of. We were closing gaps while improving. We were meeting the target, raising achievement of all kids, closing gaps. That's the right target to ensure equity and excellence. Computer skills, everything, everything. Dropout rate, one of the worst in North Carolina. There are only 115 systems in North Carolina. We were 106, but we got to 10th. Everything was about trying to be excellent. And that's what your conference is, excellence in Tennessee. Now, for those of you in business, uh, same thing here that we had in academic. Both sides of our house had to do this because how do you find the money to do what you need to do when there's difficult budget times? You've got to improve your support processes so they don't cost as much money. They worked on the same things. They had formative measures. They had collaborative teams. They had customer requirements, which is the essential curriculum for your maintenance guys. Now, one of the things we had, this was a, uh, a overtime, the red for bus drivers overtime. It was huge. It was a huge cost. It was uh, well over $140,000. And so we 
use the PDSA cycle to say reduce bus driver overtime costs. And at the time I charted this, they had saved 50000 By the end of the year, they had saved about $80,000. That's almost two teachers in North Carolina. Remember I told you the story about the fund balance? Actually, in 2001, we on paper had about $400,000, but in reality, we owed the county government well over half a million dollars, and the current budget when I took over on paper was $3 million out of whack. In other words, we had expenditures that were $300, $300 million more than our revenue. So within the first two months, I had to cut $3 million out of the budget. Thank goodness I had an interim superintendent right before me that had kind of developed a plan, and then I just tweaked it a little bit and worked the plan. When we left, uh, we had uh, certainly met our goals. We were after an 8% fund balance at uh, Red Line. We had certainly met and exceeded our goals, and that came in handy the last two years because what's happened to the education budgets across the nation? They've all been reduced. They didn't have to lay off anybody because they had fund balance. Now, that'll eventually be gone if they don't do something. So one thing we did was cut down on our workman's comp cost. Our uh, workman's comp loss ratio was one of the worst in the state of North Carolina, and uh, we put together a safety team, developed PDSA, put in place a process and approach to do it, and I think the last year we saved about 150000 on our uh, premiums. Other areas that we improved, bus discipline, energy costs, we saved $4 million over four years with energy savings. I had a little bus discipline uh, lady, one of our classified folks who was kind of a regional bus uh, person, helped with the routing of buses. One of the big problems principals told me is they were spending way too much time on discipline. They were spending half their time on bus discipline rather than being in classrooms improving instruction. We asked people to come up with ideas. This, this young lady came up with an idea for a positive behavior intervention. Uh, a lot of you educators will know that program. Implementing it not just in classrooms, but on the bus. So what she do? She publicly displayed the data. She put the charts on the wall. Bus one, the same many discipline referrals this week. Bus two. So all the kids came by and looked at it, and they saw the data. She trained the bus drivers and then tracked the data weekly. By the end of the year, she had reduced bus discipline referrals in half. Gave her a little bonus, PDSA bonus, 2% bonus for doing great work. And next thing you knew, it was district-wide. And they reduced bus discipline referrals the next year over 60% across the, across the whole district. Now, it always is we need more money. You remember? External blame. We need more money. We need more resources. We need more, 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 more. Not only were we top 10 in performance in North Carolina, we were bottom 10 in expenditures per pupil. We spent $700 less than the state average. You take 30 kids in a classroom, multiply it by $700, you do the math, that would be at least one assistance position per classroom that other people had that we didn't have. Now sure money is important, but if you use this process called Baldridge to look at all of your processes, support and core, you will find savings because every organization is 20% waste, at minimum, or more. Now here's my thing. I've shown these two triangles all over America to educators all over America, and I have guaranteed increased academic performance and closing gaps. I have guaranteed cost savings. I dare say less than 5% actually go back and do something. How do we get educators to improve? Well, the answer is you in this room. All of you work in a community that has a school system. All of you know somebody that knows somebody that's on the board or the superintendent or principal. So how do you help us improve without telling us the answers? 
because educators sometimes shut you out. So what are you going to do after this speech? So what we found out is you could have a great process and, and you'd go out and you'd wonder, is it really getting done? Here's the thing about how important it is to make sure you just do the process. Do you, Morgan Ambrose Robert, take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? Of course, that very much depends on what you mean by the question, do you? Forward-looking statements involve risk and uncertainties. We're opening up a can of worms here. <laughs> no single answer readily presents itself. I mean, have we really explored every avenue? Have the parties made certain representations, warranties, and agreements in connection with the merger? Do the parties agree to be subject to the satisfaction of the regulatory approvals as required to consummate the transaction? Who amongst us will ever know? I do. I pronounce you man and wife, you may kiss the bride. Yes, talk. Make it happen. <laughs> I'm reminded of, um, I don't know if I could work in higher ed, but I'm reminded of a lot of uh, faculty meetings as a high school principal <coughs> sitting there and trying to work out details to just do it, and we'd spend 30 minutes talking about the philosophy of the thing. You can't, you can't do that. Okay. So what we figured out is you needed to do it. This pie chart, <clears throat> what we had is we had an exceptional children's program. Those are children with special needs. We had a special reading program. And we said, we truly believe if you do this program and you do it with fidelity, you will close the gap with these children. What we found uh, in the light blue is those teachers who scored between 90 and 100% fidelity checklist their children scored proficient 96% of the time. Now look at the kind of uh, uh, yellow. What we found is there's a big fall off at the, if it's below 90%. Doug Reed's research will echo this. If it is so important to put it in place with fidelity, those of you in the hospital system, you know you've got a great process, but how do you know it's getting done the way it's supposed to get done? If you're not getting the results that you want, it's, it may not be the process, but you need to be measuring what, <clears throat> the fidelity of implementation. But when we got down to folks scoring 50 to 70 on the fidelity checklist, only 25% of their kids met proficiency. So look at fidelity of process. 96% of kids are on grade level versus 25%. What I found happening is I, you can buy every program in the world, guys. You can put Read 180 in place. You can put all these great programs in place. And everybody's always wanting a new great program because they love the new great program. They might get to go to Nashville for training. Miss two days. As a teacher, I actually get to eat lunch one day. You know, they don't get treated like professionals very often. But here's the thing. I found out we had Read 180. It's supposed to work. Research said it would work. Went out. It wasn't being deployed. We were wasting money because the process was not being employed with fidelity. So if you did any one thing, sink your teeth into two or three processes and try to come up with fidelity measures and find out if you're really doing it the way it's supposed to be done. But here's what you're going to learn, and I've learned this. Those fundamentalists are going to come out of the woodwork on you. They're going to be there. Every progressive spirit is going to be met at the gate by a thousand people <clears throat> that were appointed to guard the past. So all I've talked about so far is technical. Here's what's not going to work. I'll help you a little bit. Just facts alone will not work. Just putting the data up on the wall will not work. If it would work, the doctor puts the data on my weight every quarter and I had not done a thing with it yet. He looks at me and he says, hmm, still where you were last time? Maybe a little bit more. I say, yeah, that's bad, isn't it? I'm going to fix it next time. I'll be back in, in you know, 
three months to see you again. He said, you know, if you'd fix that, you wouldn't have to come back but once a year. I said, I'd just love to see you. <laughs> fear doesn't work. If fear worked, no child left behind would have had every child proficient by now. Fear of being labeled a failure hadn't worked. The force of that hadn't worked. Here's what does work. In, uh, on Valentine's Day 2007, my wife gave me a book. It was titled, Change or Die. Folks, Valentine's Day, Change or Die. <laughs> what if your wife gave you that book? <laughs> but it was a book that changed and really validated what I've believed for so many years. What you got to do is you got to build great relationships. You got to take small behaviors and repeat them and change them and get those small successes. And you don't ever reframe beliefs until you've built relationships and demonstrated that some of this works. Here's the reason I know all you healthcare folks know this. In Alan's book, he talks about um, heart bypass patients and the studies that they've done, study after study, it's the same thing. Heart bypass patients know they've got to change their stress. They know they've got to change their eating habits. They know they've got to change their exercise habits. But after two years, two years after bypass surgery, only one out of nine actually has implemented the changes necessary to change their life. So if they know they've got to change or they're going to end up dying and they don't change, how in the world are we ever going to get high school teachers to change their approach? This is tough work. This is the toughest work you'll ever do, but it's the most important. Now remember this, you're a lot more likely to act your way into think, a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting. The biggest mistakes I made in three separate settings before I were Statesville is I tried to bring everybody in and philosophize about the need for change, the theory of change, when I went to Ireland Statesville, I just got about the work of modeling it. Teacher said attendance was a big problem. I created a district attendance PDSA committee. We improved attendance, went from one of the worst in the state to one of the best. I showed them, I demonstrated. That's what you gotta do as a leader. You gotta demonstrate this, and then later on we were able to change and reframe beliefs. You gotta put in place some new ways of acting, something that's got to be done differently. Hold the fidelity measure to it and you'll get the changes that you need. It always helped to bring in the Baldrige feedback. The journey was never about the award or recognition. The journey was always about getting better and helping more kids achieve, raising achievement and closing gaps. That's what the journey was always about. What I think helped more than anything early on was I went out and I listened. I said, what's getting in the way? What do you need? Establish those relationships. Listen to your workforce. They know how to fix a lot of these problems. Then, just listening wasn't enough. I sent back, I said, here are the 20 things you said are getting in the way. Prioritize them. Vote. Tell me which to fix first. They voted and said attendance, and so that's what we fixed first. I sent it back out, and I said, okay, you said you know, need more resources. Prioritize them. Tell me what you need first. The technology. So we focused on a long-range technology plan. They saw that I listened, but they saw that I did something based on their listening. Public display of results. A lot of folks worry about this, but you have got to get it on the wall. It doesn't matter till it's on the wall. And the wall could be your internet, but the public display of results. And then finally, it's always going to get to this. If you believe the kids can learn, they probably will. If you don't believe kids can learn, they won't. Here's the thing I heard. We had a great school until that trailer park got put in place right around the corner. You know, 20 years ago, we had great kids. Now we got bad kids. I asked them, why you score so low? They said, we got the wrong kids. <laughs> Folks, that's what they're saying. If we had better kids, we could get better results. I hear it in every district I go in. You know, we got challenges. We got some tough kids, you know. Kids are kids. 
how many districts would I need to show you that are 90% poverty, 90% minority, and achieving 90% or higher? How many would I have to show you before you believe in children? If the answer is more than one, then you're the problem. We can do this work. It is tough work, but it's essential for our survival as a nation. This isn't just about getting more kids to graduate. This is getting more kids competitive to help us for the future. Death Valley is a tough place. Very hot, below sea level. Nothing could survive in the floor of Death Valley. Temperatures sometimes reach as high as 134 degrees. Only two and a half inches of rain annually. Desolate place. Kind of looks like some of our high schools that are called dropout factories. I mean, if, if you've been to inner, inner city Detroit, you know what I'm talking about. Tough place. Just never going to be able to survive here. These kids are never going to be able to learn. But something amazing happened in Death Valley. In 2005, they got six and a half inches of rain over a short time period. Something happened in Death Valley. Flowers, wildflowers started blooming. Landscapes of color started popping up everywhere. They called it the 100 year bloom. Beautiful panoramic views. The seeds were always there. When we look out at our nation and we hear report after report after report of what a bad job the public schools are doing, some of that's true, but there are seeds of change in every public school system. We can create a different future for our children. All we need to do is ignite a passion for learning. So I ask you today to believe in children, believe in public schools. They created the future that we had. They can create the future that we will have. Believe in your leaders, but most of all, believe in yourselves. And right now is when I want you to write down one thing that you're going to actually do. It could be one thing to help your public schools, or it could be one thing related to your business. One thing that you're going to actually do as a result of this talk this morning. You should have now three things that were interesting, two things that you want to follow up on, and one thing that you're going to actually do. The way to help our children came from the Death Valley Bloom experience. The seeds are there. Every child, no matter how desolate they look, they are our hope for the future. They are our messengers for the future. So my challenge to you, all we need to do to fix public education is to be the rain. So go out and be the rain and help public education. Thank you very much.